Good morning, everyone. My name is Randy Morse. I'm the Communications Director for the BC Rural Center, and I'll be your moderator today. On behalf of the Center's Executive Director, Gordon Borgstrom, our Board and Advisory Committee of Distinguished British Columbians, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar today on investment cooperatives featuring our, featuring our presenter, Eden Yesh. For those of you not familiar with the BC Rural Center, we're a small rural development catalyst organization dedicated to providing information and tools that will help facilitate rural development in the province. The BC Rural Center firmly believes that for rural First Nations and communities to be successful, they must have at least some control and ownership over the land and resources that surround their communities. Thus, the Rural Center and its predecessor organization, CYBAC, has done extensive research and work on community forests, community land trusts, and community-owned utilities. The BC Rural Center also believes that it's critical that rural communities have greater access to the financial resources required to help facilitate rural business and economic development. As a result, over a decade ago, the BC Rural Center began doing research and holding workshops showcasing successful community investment fund programs in the United States, Alberta, and Nova Scotia. In 2015, we partnered with today's presenter, Eden, and Kootenai Employment Services to create the first investment co-op in the interior of British Columbia, the Creston and District Community Invest Investment Cooperative. As you will hear in today's webinar, interest in community-controlled investing continues to grow in BC and across Canada. Before I turn the webinar over to Eden, a couple of quick housekeeping issues. First, we're recording this webinar and it will be posted later in both our website and that of the BC Community Impact Investment Coalition. Second, if you're interested in learning more about community-controlled investing, I encourage you to visit our website. On the top banner, if you select resources and then investment, you'll find a wide variety of videos, case studies, and links on community-controlled investment funds. Third and finally, everyone is currently on mute, or at least you should be. So if you're not, please check and make sure you are. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A function near the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to as many of your questions as possible at the end of today's webinar. I think most of you already know our presenter, Eden Yesh. Eden is the Manager of Community and Economic Development for the Kootenai Employment Services and the Chair of the BC Community Impact Investment Coalition. Eden has led the creation of the Creston and District Community Investment Cooperative, as well as the East Kootenai Columbia and West Kootenai Boundary Regional Investment Co-ops. Eden, take it away. Thank you, Randy. I'm gonna share the slideshow here. And uh, if we can just get any participant when this does pop up to fire a, a confirmation through your chat room, uh, through the chat function. Great, thanks, Trina. Perfect. All right, well, thank you. Uh, Randy, I'm not sure if you're recording on that side. I can't see it on this end. I'll leave it to you, perfect. Welcome. Um, we're gonna be releasing the Startup and Operations Guide uh, halfway through this call. Um, for the first bit, I'm gonna give you a little bit of overview of what's happening in BC and, and Canada. But uh, yeah, a big thank you to BC Rural Center, Gordon Borgstrom, and Randy Morris there. Um, it was probably about seven years ago now, we attended a call with Canadian Community Economic Development Network, who's also a panelist on this call, um, on the Nova Scotia experience back in 2012 or 13, they were talking about the Community Economic Development Investment Fund Program. And that really catalyzed what was going on here in BC. Uh, and then Gordon Borgstrom with uh, previously CYBAC, which is now BC Rural Center, hosted some of those presenters over in the Kootenays, um, where I reside, and throughout the province. And he was really um, promoting local impact investing for rural revitalization. So 
I took a keen interest in that about seven years ago, and uh, the sector has come a long ways, and there's a lot of interest. Um, 125 people registered for this webinar today, just with about uh, seven days of promoting it. So thank you all for being here, and thank you, BC Rural Centre, for hosting. Uh, and I think we're all here because there's an innate need to take back control of our resources, our finances, our investments, not just for rural revitalization, um, but for rural and urban. And these investment co-ops are working across geographies. We've got some in uh, downtown Vancouver, uh, Vancouver Island and Victoria. There's some in rural BC and spread throughout the province and throughout the country. Um, the last time I heard there was about 50 or 60 investment co-op models throughout Canada. So it is a pretty popular model. Um, I'll explain why in a little bit. Uh, but first of all, some of these, some of these slides uh, for those participants that uh, arrived early, you got to read those. This will be sent out on the slide deck. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time here, but a big thank you to our funders over the past seven years, uh, because we wouldn't have been able to come as far as we have today without the support of, of these magnificent organizations. So uh, BC through the Rural Dividend um, Fund has been supporting this sector development in British Columbia and the uh, investment co-op model. Um, most recently, uh, Canada through their ESDC Investment Readiness Program has supported the um, promotion of this guide and, and some uh, reports and, and um, and some discussions about next steps on a, on a Canadian-wide level. So they're very keen to promote that. Vancouver Foundation's been instrumental in getting this guide together um, and allowing me to dedicate some of my time over the past eight months to put this together with um, Sarah Bennett at Origin Brand. And then Kootenai Employment Services, who I work for. I've worked for KES for a decade. Um, we're a registered charity, and I'll explain a little bit more about us in a bit. Um, but we've... They've, they've really been the backbone to the backbone organization to move this sector forward um, the way it has been. And then some of our other um, supporters, um, co-op associations in Alberta and BC and in the Kootenays, BC Rural Center, of course, CED Net and uh, Miller Thompson Lawyers have been, have been big advocates and supporters as we've dug into this sector over the past seven years. Uh, so, a really quick overview of the webinar. Um, we're going to do presentations for about 40, 45 minutes. And then we're going to leave it open for the last 15 minutes for a question and answer period. So, as Randy said, uh, if you can use that Q&A function, not the chat room, because it could get messy there. But if you've got a question throughout the uh, presentation, just fire it into the Q&A function. And we'll do our best to answer as many as possible at the end of the call. And if not, um, I'll answer them after the call and send out the recording and the chat uh, the question function. So I'm gonna be talking about flight of capital and some investment trends, not just in Canada, but globally. Um, what's happening in our investment sectors right now. Uh, talk about community investment programs in Canada. And then what's been happening over the past seven years in British Columbia. I know a majority of the participants on this call will be from, from BC. Uh, talk about our BC Community Impact Investment Coalition that started up three or four years ago and the work we've been uh, doing to move the sector forward. And then, um, well, hope you're all here in the making and thanks to our funders on the last slide, it's, it's become a reality. It's been a lot of work and uh, compilation of this guide. And then I'll leave it to Michael Toy with the Canadian Community Economic Development Network to just highlight the burgeoning sector of community and across Canada. And then we'll leave it open to the Q&A period. So let's get started. Um, you're probably wondering if Kootenai Employment Services, an employment organization and charity, is talking about financing investment. Um, we're in the southern, southeasternmost uh, corner of British Columbia. And it's a retirement and um, a retirement and border town on the U.S. border. So when when there's an economic downturn, we feel it. And as an employment center, our mandate is to provide dynamic employment and community development services to reduce poverty. So there is no place to place our unemployed individuals if there's no local businesses who are the backbone of our economies. So we took an active role in small business development 
uh, over the past 10 years. We do self-employment courses. Um, start up and on. We realized we did a rural um, business retention expansion study. Or we realized quickly, not just in Creston and the, the Kootenays, but all across BC, that access to capital through a business's um, growth and startup growth and succession, uh, access to capital is one of the top barriers to business expansion. Um, and a study by BC Rural Center showed, I think it was approximately 50% of business owners in rural BC wanted to retire in five years, but they were going to have difficulties in selling their business. So um, in BC, there's been many studies saying new avenues for access to capital in rural BC, which is why we took a dive into this sector as an employment and community economic development organization. And we've been um, creating partnerships in, in the Kootenays, in the province, and, and throughout Canada, the U.S. since. So flight of capital, um, I heard this the first time by Rankin McSween over in uh, Nova Scotia, and it was a presentation he did where he was talking about the flight of capital equals the flight of population. Uh, where we send our money is where we send our jobs, our infrastructure, our investments, um, our kids, our universities. So Nova Scotia back in the 90s set up a, a community economic development investment program to incentivize Nova Scotians to invest in their own province and keep wealth circulating. The last time I checked, there was over $90 million repatriated through that program into Nova Scotia. Uh, and the economic multiplier effect of keeping investment in your own province, in your own community, is incredible. Um, so just here in British Columbia, the last statistics Canada that I looked at was 2015, and uh, British Columbians invested more than $5 billion into their RRSPs. That's not including existing RRSPs, um, tax-free savings account, or unregistered investments. So the scale of investment portfolios that we control as British Columbians that are sitting outside of our province and far away corporations, if we can just think about redirecting a portion of that, one to five percent, into our communities and keep that wealth circulating, um, that's a substantial amount of investment power. And, and um, <clears throat> I'm just going to switch this next slide. Uh, paradigm shift. So many of you on this call have probably been hearing already um, impact investing, socially responsible investment, triple bottom line investment. Um, the world is moving towards not just an economic return on your investment, but a triple bottom line. People, planet, profit, social, environmental, and economic. So there's a big transfer in wealth um, that's happening right now to millennials, which is the most diverse um, demographic out there, uh, millennials and women. And these demographics are wanting to do good with their investments while making a profit. So some of the largest investment firms, I'm sure you've been hearing about it in the last five years or so, are starting to redirect their investment strategies to these triple bottom line, these social responsible investments. The BlackRock investments, the Morgan Stanleys and Goldman Sachs even are starting to create different <clears throat> parts in their business to um, focus on this next 20 years of growth. And of course, with climate change um, as, as the biggest, biggest issue uh, globally, we need to figure out ways to finance the clean energy transition that's upon us. So... Um, it's not just about the global shifts in the investment industry. We need to make sure that the local shifts are happening too. And there's something fundamentally wrong when I can walk in to any wealth management provider in my community and there's no options for me to invest in my community. There's options to invest across the globe, but not where I live, work, and play. So these investment co-ops, these community investment um, organizations are ways to keep money circulating within local economies for some of this triple bottom line investing. And um, Michael Schumann, an economist and a um, colleague and, and previous teacher of mine, has a really good definition. Uh, sustainability requires that every community meet the needs of all its members, including plants and animals, present and future, 
without compromising the needs of other communities, meeting the needs of their members present and future. So we're, we're in a paradigm shift right now, but we need to make sure that the local uh, investment sector doesn't get overlooked. And we need to continue strengthening this local investment sector for self-reliance and um, community control on, on what we want to do. Um, some of the most complex issues in our in our society these days need to be solved at the local level. And unless we can self-finance that, it's going to be very difficult to find funding for it. So these investment co-ops are a way to self-finance some of that change. The uh, Community Impact Investment Organization, I call it Community Impact Investment Organization because there's many different ways to set up an impact investment organization. We really like the co-op model for several reasons that I'll talk about on the next slide. But there's venture capital corporations, there's community contribution companies, traditional corporations, B corporations, um, nonprofit lending societies, community bonds. We explored all of that throughout the feasibility study in, um, seven years ago. And we really like the investment co-op model for several reasons because it cuts across urban and rural. Um, and because it's community controlled, it's one member, one vote. Um, the co-ops co -ops promote the seven global co-op principles. This will be in the startup guide, you'll see that. Um, they're cost effective. They can do lending, they can do equity investing, they can do um, joint ventures, ownership of projects. So we really like that they weren't limited in what they could invest in. Um, but really that one member, one vote and local control was uh, key to why we decided to move forward with the investment co-op model rather than some of those other models. Uh, and then in British Columbia, for those of you who are on the call from BC, there's a securities exemption for cooperatives that make it cost effective to start up uh, a local investment co-op. So traditionally, um, you would have to become a registered dealer like a wealth management provider, a, a private registered dealer, or a uh, rely on the uh, prospectus, issue a prospectus every time you wanted to raise money from the, the general public. And that's very cost prohibitive, it's very expensive. Um, and registered dealers are limited in what, what they offer right now. So we were looking at creating a local fund that didn't need to issue a prospectus or go through a registered dealer. And in BC, there's the securities exemption, which allows any co-op, not just investment co-ops, but producer and consumer and farming co-ops, to raise up to $5,000 from their members um, without filing a prospectus or being a registered dealer. So we've been, we've been using that co-op exemption in British Columbia, that $5,000 co-op exemption, to raise money from many different persons and businesses and organizations in local communities. And that money is pooled at credit unions. And then we work with uh, um, Community Futures Development Corporations throughout the province, um, all five of them here in the Kootenays, to do the loans analysis on any investment application that we have come in. So members purchase shares in the co-op. Those are pooled. The, the sales from those shares are pooled at the credit union. We take investment applications into the co-op. Then those investment applications are screened by Community Futures Development Corps. And then we partner with the unions, community futures, and other organizations to finance local businesses. Um, and in the three investment co-ops that I've incorporated, throughout the bylaws, I've wrote right into the bylaws that these have to be impact investment. They can't just be small business. We need to be queuing in small business to start thinking about, you know, what are they doing in the community for community benefit, for social benefits, for environmental and uh, cultural and economic. So we ask those questions in our investment applications, which are, you know, there's templates in the startup guide for you. Uh, and then we partner with um, local organizations. We've got fee-for-service memorandum of understandings um, that you can use with your local credit union or community futures for the due diligence. And, and then uh, we have set up transparent investment co-ops, semi-transparent co-ops where the members that invest, they don't get to see the finances of the businesses that we're investing in, but they get to know which businesses we're investing in. So then 
the members, the investors become ambassadors to that business. So we're, we're trying to create a fabric and a kind of a local financial ecosystem, breaking silos apart from the traditional, you go to this lender, they don't talk to this one. Um, we're actually creating partnerships, formal partnerships between all of these. And the investment co-op is really just a tool to redirect the capital. That's what I'm trying to promote is we don't want to create a full-blown organization with the investment co-op. We just want it to be the tool to redirect capital back into our communities, pool it at the credit union, work with existing organizations like Community Futures to do the uh, loans analysis. So that's the co-op model and that's why we chose it um, in British Columbia. So we're using the $5,000 um, sec uh, securities exemption. We're also layering that with accredited investors. So any accredited investor in, in an investment co-op can use a national exemption. They can invest um, as much as they see fit. And um, yeah, I'll jump into this one. I'll just give you a second to read that because I have talked about most of this. touching on the last bullet again some of the most complex issues of our times affordable housing social justice renewable energy local food systems um, you know community economic development these have to be solved at the local level I just want to highlight that again is there's no silver bullet provincially or nationally that's going to solve issues every community is different and every community needs to solve issues in its own um, in its own nuances. So the guide that I've created is free to download, and all um, all of the appendices, all 270 pages of appendices, are editable, so that you can tailor it to the nuances of your own community. Um, so this is really just the investment co-op model is the structure but there's many different ways that you can set up this investment co-op model. Across Canada and in British Columbia, um, we found that an enabling policy environment is, is key to the uptake of um, local investment. Without it, it's gonna grow, the sector's gonna grow, but it's gonna be an uphill climb. Um, you know, Seven years ago, there was no investment co-ops in British Columbia. Now there's 12. Um, we've, we've created a coalition and a learning community to make that happen. But if you look at Quebec, if you look at the Maritimes, if you look at the United States, they have provincial legislation and tax incentives um, to promote investing in your own province and investing in your own community and investing for social and environmental impact. So for example, the CDF model, Community Economic Development Investment Fund model, um, if you invest in Nova Scotia uh, CDF, you get a 35% return on your um, investment through a, a tax credit. And then they incentivize slow money so that if you hold it in for another five years, the first tax credit is you have to hold it in for five years. If you hold it in for another five years, you get another 20% tax credit. And if you hold it in up to 15 years, you get another 10% or 15% tax credit. So 60 to 65% of your principal um, of investment into your own province, into your own community is, is guaranteed by tax credits. And then they fast track that to be RSP eligible. So those type of incentives, those type of programs to be incentivizing private capital into social and economic and environmental uh, impacts in our own province in British Columbia are, are definitely necessary. Uh, we have the Venture Capital Corporation Program here in BC, which is very successful for the reasons it was made and the different eligible financing sectors that it can finance. But it's not um, it's not touching uh, on what we're what we're trying to achieve. Um, so very very fortunately in the last year, um, the social finance and social innovation program that the uh, federal government launched is uh, putting some wins behind our sales and definitely supporting what we're trying to do here in British Columbia and across the country is to help social purpose organizations and businesses trying to make change for social and environmental impacts 
um, there, there's uh, the new federal social finance and social innovation fund that's uh, about to be launched. So uh, Michael Toy is going to talk about that later on in the call. But um, definitely it's key to have enabling policy environment and, and um, I'll talk a little bit about more how that's happening in British Columbia right now. So the sector growth in BC, just a quick synopsis of what's happened. Um, Michael Toy and the CED Network hosted the Nova Scotia Experience, which was a webinar back in 2013. And again, a lot of different stakeholders from British Columbia were on that call. And we started to research and develop models of community investment. Um, and 90%, 95% of the models in our impact investment coalition or investment co-ops because of that securities exemption and because it's very cost effective to start up an investment co-op. So in 2015, the BC Community Impact Investment Coalition started uh, and we've been developing the sector and resources and policy advocacy ever since. Uh, and there's been, you know, since 2015, since we launched the coalition, there's been over 30 communities that have gotten in touch with me to, um, um, request assistance on how to start up an investment co-op model in BC. Um, so thankfully we've got some funding this last year to put together this guide and, and, um, and provide this to those communities and more. So here's some of the investment, uh, investment co-ops and investment organizations that exist, uh, out there in British Columbia and on the uh, BC community impact investment coalition the coalition also consists of different supporting organizations, co-op developers, um, you know, the BC Co-op BC Co-op Association is a big supporter of what we're trying to do and using the co-op model for financing community change and uh, lawyers and accountants. So it's a pretty robust uh, coalition and we do meet, uh, we do meet monthly on web conferences and we're continuing to develop resources and because it's a cooperative sector we're sharing resources and tools and best practices amongst each other um, we've developed an accounting opinion for investment co-ops that's getting updated this year um, and and possibly looking for a a, a formal um, canadian opinion for investment co-ops across canada we've been looking into the research and development of a securities compliance and crm platform that everybody can share to limit the administration of the investment co-ops. We're all doing membership applications and updating corporate registers and selling shares. And that's all done either in um, paper-based um, files or through a, a digital file network like Google Drive and Google Sheets and Forms. So to streamline this, to limit the amount of time volunteers have to take to be able to have investor and member facing um, platforms where the investor can complete these rather than scanning a form in and then having to be uploaded manually this is all we're still in the development of this it's still a six or seven year old sector in bc and it's come a long ways but there's still a long ways to go um, last year we hosted a public uh, and practitioner forum in, in uh, downtown vancouver the first community impact investment uh, forum and you know over 80 people attended that um, organizations local governments provincial governments securities commission uh, sector organizations like the bc co-op sector and community futures there's a lot of support for this uh, sector in british columbia and our coalition is kind of kind of the leading edge for advocating for community programs and policy in bc so we've got pretty robust policy recommendations to our provincial government uh, but what it really revolves around is we need to create an inter-ministry task force on community investment and it has to have practitioner representation on it to co-create public policy similar to the social innovation social finance uh, program had a co-creation steering committee we need something like that in bc to say you know the venture capital corporation program is doing well for the reasons it was uh, created. We need a community investment uh, pro by other provinces in our country. It exists out there. We need to move those kind of learnings to British Columbia. 
complete with legislation and tax credits to incentivize private capital to solve some of these issues in our in our um, in our current society. And then in the short term, there's the five thousand dollar exemption that we're operating under for um, investment co-ops that could be amended um, in the short term. And it's not just investment co-ops, it's co-ops of all types, housing co-ops, investment co-ops, consumer co-ops, grocery co-ops, um, you know, any co-op can use that exemption to raise capital more effectively. And because there's a democratic control mechanism built into the co-op structure, which is one member, one vote, it's very, very unlikely, and there hasn't been any cases in Canada or the US of securities fraud in cooperatives. So uh, limiting it to a $5,000 lifetime limit is um, is uh, is unnecessary in our mind. So we're asking for uh, updates to that security exemption, and and we are in active discussions with the province and the Securities Commission uh, ongoing for the past three years. So it's great to see that they're they're taking an interest to this and um, and uh, having some open dialogue. That's about it. So uh, to jump into the startup and operations guide, uh, I'm not going to spend too much. I'm gonna spend about five minutes into this because you're gonna, it'll take you a while to dive through it. It's 317 page manual. Um, we've spent, it's basically seven years of the compilation of our research and development and incorporation of three different investment co-ops and helping to support the BC uh, Community Impact Investment Coalition and that sector growth. So there's the development process, there's business planning sessions, there's marketing products, incorporation templates, operational best practices, administration templates, policy and procedure manual, and some fee-for-service templates. Those were for the um, um, working with local financial institutions like credit unions and community futures to help you with the due diligence and uh, loans analysis. So uh, it is broken into six phases. Uh, the first three phases are basically, you know, is this feasible in your community? Is there a core group of champions? Lay your foundation, uh, figure out what the scope of your investment co-op is going to be. And then phase two, start building um, capacity in your community advisory group, in your community at large, start hosting some sessions. Is there an interest out there from investors and businesses? We've got surveys, templates for you to use, and this is all editable as well. And then number three is six different business planning sessions. Um, these are definitely related to the BC uh, British Columbia policy environment right now, but there's no reason that um, the whole startup guide and the business planning sessions can't be, you know, there's inspiration here on the community development process and business planning for other jurisdictions. Um, the securities laws might change, uh, but the whole underlying theme is the same. So phase three is your business planning sessions with your community advisory group and all of the different questions. We've, I've asked a lot of questions in the last seven years to lawyers, to co-op developers, to accountants, to you know, sector organizations, investment, uh, wealth management providers. So I've put in all of the questions I can think about into the business planning sessions and then give you the opportunity to, you know, here's four options. It's basically a choose your own adventure guide. If you want to do this, a narrow region focused on just agriculture, or if you want to do a larger, broader region focused on small business and any kind of impact, you can, you can choose how you're going to tailor the investment co-op model based on those business planning sessions. And then phase four to five, uh, four, five, and six is, you know, once you go through the business planning session, we really recommend you talk to a co-op developer, a, a co-op investment co-op consultant and a lawyer. Um, Cause at that point, you're going to have all the content you need to create your memorandum, your rules um, and all your legal documents for incorporation. And then, you know, we recommend either, we say in the guide that you can either start with a small group of individuals and then market later to investors, but what we've found with the securities uh, exemption that we're operating under is it's, it's better to um, incorporate with as many uh, members as possible because there's a 12 month um, waiting period to sell investment shares in the, uh, in the co-op exemption that exists now. So the three investment co-ops that I've helped incorporate have had over a hundred 
um, members each incorporate and sign on to the legal documents to found to become a founding member of the co-op, which also you know adds to the story as well, is that they helped create this new organization. It's almost like the credit unions. Um, back in the 60s and 70s when, when they were just around kitchen tables talking about starting up a new financial institution. This is what some of our members have, some of our members were, were the initial founding members of credit unions and initial founding members of these investment co-ops. So it's pretty, pretty neat to see. And then a whole bunch of templates on how to operate and um, continue maintenance of your investment co-op. Um, Sarah Bennett with uh, Origin Brand Strategic Development. Uh, and I have been in discussion since September, creating, uh, you know, editable and kind of like a baseline of marketing communications materials for investment co-ops, for investors, for borrowers to the co-op and for financing partners like credit unions and community futures and wealth management providers. So these, again, are all editable, um, free for download, and you can take them and use them. Um, put your own website in them and your own investment co-op name. It's got branding guidelines and everything. So she's done a wonderful job at this. And then, uh, yeah, there's about 40, 40 something pages of the community development process, but the rest of the guide is actual templates. They're all appendices. Uh, I'm not going to dive into it now. You can, you can, uh, at your own leisure. Um, but everything from the getting the community capacity built and you know choosing your initial community advisory group with the community advisory group skills matrix appendix number two what perspectives are you missing you want to make sure you've got as many perspectives as possible before you start on the journey of incorporating an investment co-op and then you've got surveys you've got business planning sessions incorporation documents um, and then the rest of it is on the right side is for your, the operations and maintenance of uh, of your investment co-op. So right now, I would uh, I'm going to I'm tr trying to save enough time for question and answer periods at the end. I'm going to um, flip it over to Michael Toy, who's the executive director at Canadian Community Economic Development Network, and it's definitely full circle. I mean, seven years ago was the Nova Scotia experience, and I was an attendee on that webinar, Michael, that you hosted with Chris Payne and uh, at the Securities Commission. And um, I mean, Michael Toy has been instrumental. BC Rural Centre has been instrumental in supporting this, the local impact investment sector in British Columbia um, and the investment co-op model. And Michael's also helping to share the, the learning lessons of BC across the country too. So Michael, I'll, uh, I'll leave it with you from here. Thanks, Eden. I'll, I'll be quick because I know we want to get to questions and uh, I'm sure people are dying to know where can they download this guide. But um, <clears throat> I just want to say, yeah, we've been very happy to be working with the BC Community Impact Investment Coalition for the last uh, three or four years, supporting members like the Kootenai Employment Services, BC Rural Centre, the Vancouver Island Community Investment Co-op, and the wider coalition and across BC and across Canada, for that matter. For people that don't know, uh, SEDNET, Canadian Community Economic Development Network, it's an, a national association of organizations and individuals that are pursuing the triple bottom line, you know, it, it integrated approaches to economic opportunities that produce uh, environmental and social benefits. Just uh, as you mentioned on some of the early slides, Eden, and in fact, uh, the Michael Schumann quote uh, you raised, it's great to see, I think he's on the call here, so it'd be nice to hear from him a bit later. But the community investment model is really started out in Nova Scotia, as you mentioned, 20 years ago, inspired by US examples that Michael could probably talk to, and then going from to Manitoba, Prince Edward Island, New Brunswick, Alberta had a program uh, a provincial program and then lost it last year. But members across the country, SEDNET members like Momentum in Calgary or the Alberta Community and Co-op Association and the Cooperative Enterprise Council in New Brunswick really have been instrumental in supporting the policy changes that make these, uh, um, these practices a little more feasible because the practice is always ahead of the governments and scaling requires support. You talked about the regulatory uh, changes and the incentives that need to be shifted so that the system doesn't met couple simply flow out of communities, but can redirect it. And right now, all the systems are directed towards uh, capital leaving communities. So from our perspective, this is a critical part of the social finance ecosystem across the country. And people on the webinar today may have heard about work done 
towards a social innovation, social finance strategy over the last, last few years. Right now, this, uh, the, that strategy is really focused on an investment readiness program, which is leading towards a social finance fund that may be coming online uh, later this year, or at least the first steps of it. But the investment readiness program is designed to move social purpose organizations along the investment readiness continuum and community investment funds can play a, a vital role in a blended range of capital to support social enterprises and social purpose organizations, as well as source new and innovative project ideas that might be a little further off the, off the beaten path. And I think that's, that's really the heart, and you touched on this, Eden, of a community investment model is that people want to be part of the solution. Uh, the capital that they can shift, a very small port percentage of a portfolio, can make a significant difference in a community, but it's always the local assets, the wisdom, the knowledge, the talent that people uh, invest along with that, uh, that money in uh, their revitalization of their community, that engagement that I think is really transformational. So um, I won't say any more at this point. I know there are some questions, uh, but we look forward to continuing to work with uh, innovative practitioners across the country, in BC, Alberta, and the Maritimes, everywhere this is happening to advance community investment in Canada. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate all the support and uh, the new IRP program and social finance um, program is just amazing what uh, federal government's been uh, putting out. Uh, Randy, are you able to find Michael Schumann? Yes, I, I believe he's unmuted now. Perfect, I, Michael, can you hear us? I can hear you and can Perfect. you hear me? We can hear you, yes. I just quick introduction. Michael Schumann's an economist out of the uh, United States and is a big advocate for local investment and uh, an author, a lawyer, an economist, and an old Simon Fraser University teacher that about eight or nine years ago, I took a course um, through Simon Fraser, Community Economic Development, and Michael was an instructor. So, um, yes, I've been... <laughs> I've been uh, deep into the Kool-Aid of local investment. So, Michael, I'll let you talk about what's happening in the United States with uh, local investments and the different tools and groundswell of, of interest and models that are taking place, maybe just for five minutes, and then we'll leave 10 minutes for uh, participant questions. Sure. Um, so I'll just say, first of all, uh, congratulations on this great piece of work. And it's very inspiring to us here, and I often use Canadian models as a way of nudging other people in the United States to do more better. Um, we, a group of us um, under the auspices of the Solidago Foundation and the uh, National, National Coalition for Community Capital just put out a handbook ourselves on US models um, that's similar to what you've done. And if anyone's interested, um, you could look it up. It's at comcapcoalition.org forward slash CIF for Community Investment Fund Handbook. Um, and we cover 10 models in the United States. And uh, we talk, we have, as you do, a number of templates and suggestions for how to organize all this. And then we do a sort of deep dive in the legal issues around this. Um, and unlike in Canada, where co-ops are a really interesting way of creating investment funds, except in the area of real estate, uh, that option is not really available for us right now. But I will say, and I think this is something that is relevant to Canadians, um, that our experience is that, that reforming of securities laws, uh, while it's highly technical, actually is something that can generate support from across the political spectrum. Um, when we did our crowdfunding reforms back in 2012, the initial ones, I mean, we got super majorities of the Tea Party Republicans and the Bernie Sanders uh, progressives, and uh, that was what was responsible for changing national investment law, and then we changed investment law in 37 of the 50 states. 
Um, many of us see a similar kind of push now essential around investment funds. And unlike Canada, we have a whole different regulatory um, apparatus around funds that greatly hems us in. Um, but, but I think that, you know, many of us are thinking that if we can put in a co-op exemption or some kind of limited co-op exemption, that would be a very powerful device. And at that point, we would like to uh, borrow as much of what you have done as possible and put it to work. And let me just say two final things. Um, one which was not mentioned directly so far, but I think is very important is that New Brunswick has had a tax credit for local investment uh, for a couple of years now. Uh, very few people know about it. It's undersubscribed. But I think that in combination with this kind of local investment fund uh, initiative, I think it is a very powerful tool. And the other thing that I thought um, you recommended that is very powerful, and I, I will bring back to my colleagues in the United States, is really trying to build an active coalition so that people don't need to recreate the wheel. And thank you for all of those uh, 270 pages of templates and appendices because it'll save everyone a lot of work. And I think everyone should keep you know tinkering with them and coming up with better ones. But this is the, the, the beautiful part of co-ops is that, you know, there is a principle that we're all in it for one another. And I think we can move this field very quickly with that uh, philosophy. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. And I appreciate all the work you're doing. And, and um, in my research and development for everybody on the call, there's many different um, investment fund guides out there. And Michael's got one out there. We've got this one for co-ops in BC. Don't just look at this new BC Investment Co-op Guide. Go and take a look at some of the other ones. I have put in the resources section of the Community Investment Startup Guide a link to other investment co-op guides out there. Um, and I believe I've put Michael's in there as well. So, yeah, take a look at all of them because you can get inspiration from every, everywhere. Um, and I did update the website recently. Uh, I do see some questions that I'll answer uh, I'll answer out loud rather than typing, because I'm sure you don't want to hear me type. And if you have any questions now, you can um, you can raise your hand or throw them through the question and answer function at the uh, bottom of your screen. If you just wave your mouse around, there's a Q&A function. So I'll try to answer for the next 10 minutes as many questions as possible. Uh, but when you're, when you're able to, then you can hop back to BC Impact Investment com slash resources, and there's a short form there to complete and in the form submission you'll have a link to the uh, Google Drive where we share the the master startup guide and all its 317 pages of glory that uh, Sarah Bennett helped create and make look really pretty from a Microsoft Word document that I had and all of the editable uh, file networks so it's a view only but you can download it to your personal computers and you know work with local marketing firms to take those uh, marketing and communications pamphlets and, and brand guidelines um, and the, the entire template uh, network. So let me jump into the Q&A. Um, from Celeste, would small nonprofits that are education social impact based be able to utilize funding from community investments? Uh, the models that we have set up with the investment co-op the of course you can invest into a social enterprise that's a nonprofit or charity um, that but the the project that you're investing in has to have a return on investment so the co-ops will not be sustainable if they don't have any interest income that's their that's their major um, source of revenue um, to both pay administration fee uh, member investors a small return on their investment. So, um, yes, they can invest into nonprofits as long as those nonprofits have a project that's, you know, a social enterprise that can generate revenue that can pay back a loan or an investment. Um, even housing, housing co-ops as well. John Daniel Cousin, is there a limit to the total amount that an investment co-op can aggregate from member investments? 
Uh, if you're selling investment shares through the current securities law, my understanding is that you're capped at $750,000. Because there's a lifetime limit of $5,000 per member, and you can't sell more than 150. Once your investment co-op has over 150 members, you can't sell investment shares um, anymore. So technically, you could be capped at 750. However, we've just launched investment co-ops in the Kootenays that are just selling membership shares, and there are, there are several other models out there. And the way that we interpret the securities laws, just like Mountain Equipment Co-op has tens of thousands of members that all purchase a membership share, they're not capped on the amount of members they have. Um, and they could technically use this um, securities exemption to, to raise capital from their members, tens of thousands of members, through the sale of membership shares if they increase the share price. So we're selling, uh, for example, here in the Kootenays, we're selling $1,000 membership shares, uh, and you can purchase five of those. But there's no cap on the number of members we're allowed in our co-op, so technically we could have 500 or 1,000 members all purchasing $5,000. And as well, there, there's the accredited investor exemption, which is a national exemption to, uh, to the securities prospectus and registered dealer requirements. That accredited investor exemption is a high net worth individual or, or um, organization can invest whatever they deem appropriate to their own investment portfolio. So we've had a couple of accredited investors, uh, I believe, access some of our co-ops. Uh, Michelle Lavasser, do you have supporting research that helped you build the guide and provide recommendations? background. We are currently exploring an idea of developing cooperative in our region, rural Alberta, three communities of 2,300 people and less. There's about a 15-page appendices called case studies, Michelle, in the startup guide, and that's meant to give you some inspiration on how to, you know, this is how to set up an investment co-op in BC, but community impact investment, we've provided maybe 20 or 30 different examples from across Canada and abroad about how people are setting up community investment models and what they're investing into. So those case studies should be, um, give you, get your creative juices flowing. I'm hoping that answers your question. Uh, Sean Markey, thank you for the webinar. Can you please speak to local demand for investing? generating local demand and building capacity for local demand good question sean another previous instructor at simon fraser university of mine um, local demand for investing uh, we've before we launched any investment co-op in the Kootenays, we were circulating investor and business surveys to make sure that there wasn't enough interest from local investors um, I've talked to many different wealth management providers as well in my travels throughout the Kootenays and throughout the province. And while they can't promote products that aren't their own, they still want to provide clients with an, with an option, with a, an affordable and efficient and a safe option to invest in their community. Um, so we're hearing it from wealth management providers. We're hearing it from the business surveys. We're also hearing from... Um, local businesses, that's not the investment side, but the need for investment is there um, on the local business side through business retention expansion studies and uh, BC Economic Development Association um, confirmation. And then building capacity for local demand. That's a big one we're going through right now. We're um, in the Kootenays, we're piloting some kind, some partnerships and marketing and communications that between the three investment co-ops that we've incorporated, five community futures development corporations, and several credit unions, we cover 44 communities in the Kootenai Rockies region. And we're now starting to work together to try to generate awareness of the opportunities for local investment and for local financing. Um, so hoping that answers your question. Yes, there's, there's definitely local, um, interest and demand it does take a, a a fair bit of generating awareness though because these models are so new and so small 
in their in their formative years. But uh, the partnerships we have and the people that are sitting on our board of directors are chamber of commerce managers, branch managers at credit unions, um, community futures staff, economic development managers and officers. So the people that are sitting on the investment co-op are the mover and shakers of the community. So it's really easy to get the word out once, once we get going and get the foundation built. Um, and I'm looking at the time. There's, a, there's one more minute left. I'll try to answer a couple more. Graham Stanley, are there any policies regarding terms of payment, et cetera, in the guide, or is this left to the organization? I didn't include those in the guide, Graham, but I do have um, some promissory notes in terms of payment. Actually, yes, they are in the guide. Sorry, they are in the guide in terms of uh, financing. But I do have an extra set of uh, promissory notes and kind of the lending documents that I didn't include in the guide um, that I can send as a, an addendum. Sam, do you have an example of an initial startup capital investments, mix of individual and business and, gov and or government? Uh, about 90% of our investors are individuals. Uh, the other 10% are businesses investing through the corporate um, accounts. And then what we've invested in, there's been a um, downtown revitalization project in Creston. There's been several um, small businesses. Um, I can't, I know on the BC Impact Investment website, you can go to the different investment co-ops out there and go to their website. There's some um, release of information that needs to be done from our investment co-ops to be able to tell the general public who we're investing in, but some of the investment co-ops, you can see the type of businesses they're investing in. Uh, Graham, how many are the capital pools created? In the first few co-ops, it's anywhere from 75,000 to about 400,000 in the capital pools, depending on how um, successful your initial membership launch was. Um, and those are continuing to grow. Michelle, can you explain the difference between selling of shares and selling of bonds? Um, I might have to take that one offline, but I believe the selling of bonds is an actual, you know what kind of repayment structure you're getting. The selling of shares is you're, you're purchasing equity in the co-op. Membership shares, you're an owner and equity investor of the co-op, and we pool that equity investment, and we lend that equity investment out we finance other businesses through lending or um, equity or ownership projects. So members of a co-op purchase a piece of equity of the co-op and they get a voting share. Um, bonds are, I think, a specific payback period and an interest rate. And Scott, can a community service co-op act as an investment co-op or is it better to partner? An investment co-op, I believe, has to be a for-profit co-op and a community service co-op is a non-for-profit model. So Scott, I think you have to do the for you have to incorporate a new for-profit co-op that's able to sell investment and membership shares unless you looked at the community bond model that michelle's talking about you could sell a ton of different membership shares and issue bonds through your nonprofit. and i think that's all we have time for folks so randy maybe i'll let you wrap this up but um thank you all for attending and uh please share that guide widely through your networks we're trying to spread this model like wildfire so um, it is registered in creative commons free to download and free to tweak um, please just give credit to Kootenai employment services if you are going to repurpose the, any of the documents thank you Eden we'll make sure that link is on the BC Rural Center's website as well so in closing I'd like to quote the French philosopher Voltaire who once famously wrote it is with people as it is with books. A few good ones make all the difference. And I'm reminded of that quote in listening today's web, to today's webinar. Uh, there are some extraordinary people who've brought us to this point, certainly Eden, Michael, Michael down in the States, and my colleague Gordon. Thank you all for taking a leadership role in this. I'm certain that most of our participants found this interesting. And um, I noticed one of the comments in the Q&A, Eden, thanked you for, for uh, I'll personalize it and say your, but of course, he's really referring to the collective's generosity in doing this work and then making it available to 
to uh, other community members across rural British Columbia. So on behalf of the BC Rural Center, Eden, Michael, and Michael down in the USA, thank you so much. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for participating. Again, as I said at the outset, there'll be a recording of today's webinar made available very shortly via our website. If you're anxious to receive it, just let me know, drop us a line at info at bcruralcenter.org and we'll be sure to send you the link. Thanks very much all.